of the most thing that a person could ever do to a human race was to establish a residential school for what they have done to our people. And it's right across Canada and it's even somewhere in the States. And that was just to take us away and put us into a residential school to to uh, to teach us uh, probably under their culture. While our, our culture at the same time is being diminished. So for us to become non-Aboriginal people, that's what it was all about. And the cruelty and, and the sickness that happened in this residential school is something very, very hard for a lot of our people to get over today. And it's still, there's, it's so thick within our communities, within our people, to, uh, to really let go. And you probably hear about a lot of workshops and courses that are going on so people can begin their healing and get on with this anger, but it's, it's a hard thing, it's a very hard thing to do. Things were a bit more stricter for our people. Uh, for example, you needed a permission to come off the reservation type thing, you know, or come out of the community. And um, if you enlisted in war, you were uh, disenfranchised, which uh, means your status was taken away and you couldn't get access to any of the services other First Nation people had access to and um, it uh, you know you weren't allowed in certain establishments you weren't allowed in certain places these agreements really they provide benefits to all Yukoners and they're really about putting self-government powers back in the hands of communities so um, their goal was that First Nations governments and people are equal participants in the Yukon, that they have a say in their own futures uh, and they can set the priorities of their own community. Canada made a law to do what you call the residential school error and that uh, was designed to uh, kill the Indian in you. That's and uh, many uh, children were taken to be able to stop or to wipe out the people. It's almost like genocide there, you know, and the children are the ones that are the future and they take the children against the will away from the parents, their grandparents, separate from the people. They're not allowed to speak their language, to practice their culture or anything else like that. I know because uh, I was one of these kids. Non-status and the status uh, associations, they formed together to, to become the Council of Yukon Indians. And part of why we had to structure that way, believe it or not, Indians weren't allowed to have bank accounts. We never got the vote until in the 60s, I believe it was. So we had to create societies to be able to fund our activities as Indian people. So that was why at the beginning the societies were created and they continue today. The whole land claims agreements replaced the Indian Act and through the self-governing First Nation it allows each First Nation to develop their constitution. And you know the constitution, it's, the supreme, it's our supreme law, it's all there. So it helps us build up our, our government structure. It, um, it establishes a different uh, agency. It gives the authority through our agreements. Our First Nation government, our council has the authority and jurisdiction to develop laws. And the whole agreements itself too, it's talking about building relationship and partnership. That's what it's about. Um, and to me, that's how I feel. And that's why I think today, and I keep telling myself, I felt that I have addressed my healing through the whole resident through the whole land claims discussion and through the implementation we start implementing these agreements that to me that's reconciliation so I look at what you owning an airline I look at what Vince Hollandown is doing I look at what Trondek is doing I look at what Tehran is doing I look at all the nations and I look at them and I just could nearly weep with pride that they're doing exactly what Elijah and those elders wanted us to do. They don't want no handout. We'll work hard. We will invest. 
And this working hard and investing in ourselves is good not only for us, but for this territory. Because the more wealth generation that we create, the more wealth that we retain in our communities, then the better the infrastructure, the better the support systems for everybody who lives here. One of the things that the, the First Nations people did was the they acknowledged and recognized that we had to work together with other people that live here. One of the elders told me, you can't draw a line around yourself, that you have to deal with these other people. So in the process, we designed mechanisms of co-management. We provided a seat at the table for non-native people to work directly with us at the community level. The renewable resource councils, the environmental assessment process, land use planning, the list goes on. We provided an opportunity to hear your voice and hope that you'd be able to understand us and where we were coming from and the need to look after this land for everybody. It's not just for us. When we were doing the modern land claim and self government agreements, we looked at those treaties and said, no, you're not giving us a handful of beads and a bunch of blankets and five bucks a year. That's not gonna cut it. <laughs> What we want is an opportunity to come into Confederation whole on honest and honorable grounds where we can have the same opportunity as you and, and we earn it just like you. We're not asking, and Elijah Smith said that when he first met with Trudeau in the 70s with our chiefs. We're not asking for handouts. We never asked for them that the Indian Act and the social safety net that was imposed upon our people got to be imposed and then uh, for so many generations has had a negative effect on our ability. It's the Indian Act that created residential schools. It was the Indian Act that created reservations. It was the Indian Act that prevented Aboriginal women from advancing ahead. And so we had that struggle. What you're doing now by taking this journey. I'm sure for each and every one of you, particularly you younger, it was a leap of faith, it was an adventure, it's a challenge. Not fully sure what it's gonna be like, not fully sure what I'm gonna hear. Hell, I don't even know if I'm gonna like it. <laughs> but I feel pretty confident that by the time you land in Moose Hall, by the time you get off the river and you walk up into that gathering, and it's, bunch of people, native and non-native alike, all celebrating, being happy about the summer, life, harvesting, being together. I'm sure you're going to feel very good about your experience. I heard on the radio why you were doing this. I wholeheartedly support it. And to see the blend of young native kids with non-native kids doing this, is exactly what the Elijah and them were talking about. We had enough of being carved off and being separate. It's time to move forward together. And I bid you a safe journey together on your trip. And thank you for this. It's a good day for the road. I was taken many years ago and we weren't allowed to speak our language. And if you do, you were caught, you were severely punished. And, uh, but in a way, The only good thing that came out of that was all the different First Nations that I met, the 
the Cascos, Klingits, and when we left, we were old enough. There was a brotherhood and a sisterhood, whatever, among us. It didn't matter if we we're different from different people, and I said, and to us, we we're just one people. We've been there together, and we've been through it. I would give my shirt off my back for one of them today, and today I can I see them that continue to to suffer. They hold many memories. Many of them are using alcohol to wipe up the memories of what happened to to them when they were smaller. I know because uh, I was one of them. I used alcohol for many years to to forget about what happened to me. And it wasn't until years ago that an elder that helped me, that took me and said, you're coming with me, that helped me. And he took me out. I owe him everything and uh, nonstop for three days he was hitting a drum on top of a mountain and the wind and the rain. He was saying, let it go, let it go, let it go in the wind. Flashbacks of all my friends that committed suicide and tears and all the emotions that you go through. And on the, one day the sun came up and his, his drum slowed down and he says, okay, it's time to go down. Even though we never ate or anything, I don't I, it's hard to explain. You felt like almost you're born again. And then I knew who I was. I'm a Northern Toshone warrior of the Crowed Land. And started rediscovering our ways my culture of who I am and sharing that with whoever I can to show the world the beauty of, of who we are. The eagle is one of the, the bird that flies the highest and almost touches the heavens in Odinji in meaning creator, meaning God, and uh, giving an eagle feather is many things there. Not only gives them strength, but also shows love, compassion, and everything else they got there. And it's a great honor just to receive one. We know we're pitiful. The ancestors said we're pitiful. The only reason we're still in existence is because the ancestors and the Creator have has blessed us on a daily basis. And we acknowledge that when we left on our journey. When we acknowledge that, we made this trip spiritual. Everything we saw out in the land after we cleansed ourselves came to us in a good way. We're just like batteries we were trying to charge. We're 100% now charged. It's in each and every one of us, our job that has been out there to bring all of that power and goodness from the land and leave it here in the community. When we leave here, we'll pick up all the negative energy we could, just like a sponge, you know, the one sponge we clean up our boats with, just like that. And on our journey back down to the next stop, We'll spread it out to the ancestors because they can take care of it. They will take care of it. And the community will become stronger and healthier spiritually because of it. That is our purpose. That's why we're on this, on this journey. It's not a sightseeing tour. You're not there because of chance. You are sent here for a reason. Very good job. The one that are leaving us today, their job has been done. That's why they're they're, they're not continuing on with us. Their job is done. They ask for healing or whatever they ask for, 
they got it. So they're moving on. For the rest of us, we will continue on. We'll be doing what we've always been asked to do. What we committed ourselves to. Maybe we can change our world around. Maybe we can wave this fertile ground. The time we have may never come around. The time we have can surely be right now. Oh. Maybe we should hold against the odds. Maybe favor plays our card. When I came back from my uh, from residential school, my parents made me um, learn my language again because I had broken language and you know, I couldn't speak my language. Like when I was a little girl, I used to speak fluently, really good. And then when they took me away, I wasn't allowed to speak. I wasn't allowed to even um, to say fork or anything. If I even say one thing in order to show me, uh, I'll get punished. This was at Carcross. Well, my siblings and I were in the residential school. We, um, we were like, the school official did not tell us that our father had passed away. We didn't know that because the school, the school year ended um, on June the 18th of every, year, I think June 18th or whatever, in that time. And when we got home, that's when we learned about his death. And it was very difficult. And that was the first time I heard of Indian Affairs or Indian Agent. I never heard tell of it till then, because my father was a trapper and, and we were self-sufficient under his um, supporting us and, and providing for us. We lived a good life. I elders say, are you going to let your kids go through what you went through? I said, not a chance. I will never ever let my kids go through an institution. That's what I call it, a residential school. And it's like a jail. I watch a lot of my family and my friends, they just suffer. You try to talk with them and plead with them. I know my mother does when she sees it all the time, it just breaks her heart. But it's what a lot of those children went through. Starvation, angry, bullying. You get picked on, get names calling, uh, sexual abuse, mental, physical, you know, it's just, it's a very hard thing to to work at. And but it's a good thing that a lot of our people never give up. If you move your lip, it's like, a who are you talking to? You know, you get strapped. I never ever get strapped before by my parents or anybody. They always talk to me before, before I get spanking or something. And but I never get really severe punishment like I do in residential school. But my mother was left with 
young my young siblings and our, us along with her with no means of support of any kind. We were just, just like that. And and the government issued what they called a monthly ration. And that's all my mother got to support us and feed us and clothe us or whatever each month. And I cannot remember for the life of me what the amount was, but somehow, if at all, if it was $50 or $75 a month. You know, and this is to destroy us from our language, destroy us from our culture, destroy us from who we really are as, as a First Nation person. So that's their, that was their game plan, was to do exactly that, to become just like them. And like I said, we weren't even considered as a person when, when they were running us back then. But like you always hear this phase, uh, phrase that everybody always say, you know, the, the goal of, this, of the school was to, to kill the Indian and the child. How else better can you say it? Because that's what it was all about. Just before you guys come, I can see a whole bunch of spirits over there. They're all alongside and very tall. And they knew that you were coming. That was very, very important because this is their, their, their home.
and they come to bless you. Whatever they bless you with, it's going to be up to you how you're going to use that blessing. When you go back from going back to your past, it's the wrong direction. You got to go ahead to make a good plan. Every single day is a new day. So do we make those plans? How do we make them? Things that you've gone through, the hard time. You got to look at, at that hard time and say, okay, this is what I need from it. And the rest I don't need no more. So you put it aside. You never look back at it again because it will come forward to you again. And part of that healing is that when you journey for tomorrow and next day, that's the plan that you have to stick with. Not what happened yesterday. Not all those people gossiping about you. All these things that come into place, it's not important. Today I see how much the environment has changed our people, our animals, our land, our water. Every day I pray for that, that somebody comes to be born with the gifts of cleaning the Mother Earth. We can only live here one time. But when we take life <clears throat> and not look at it seriously and not helping the healing, the aspect of the whole world and everything that lives in it, and we take advantage of the life just for ourselves, it will never work. This is what's been happening for a long time. Every day when we pick up our drum, we pick up our tools, we pick up our flutes, we pick up our guitars. Those are the songs that we're supposed to sing to all living things. Because those songs also heal everything. I work a lot with uh, corrections uh, across Canada also penitentiaries. And I see how people are so suppressed. Yeah. There's just this box they have to stay in. And there's no room for them. When I go into the penitentiary, the penitentiary I see the negativities, the sadness, the fear. I feel all that with them. And, and just to sit down with them, um, privately, stories that is unbelievable that they go through in life. But I go in there to do ceremonies, I go in there to do healing and to help the people. Sometimes they want to release them from penitentiary across Canada, then we have a place for them to do that. And it's really, really important never to leave anybody out. It's really important to connect everybody to reconnect everybody. There were lots of people also came for healing. Um, some people were very, very ill with cancer, tumors, uh, with different illness, and they would come here to get healing from across Canada and United States. And, um, and for us, um, it was really, really important that we don't let people go until they're completely healed. So people that were coming here were also seeing the ceremonies happening and, uh, and the people were getting well. Some of the people came here had huge tumor bigger than the size of the soft baseball. And, um, but they left, there was nothing wrong with them. These, because of the spirit of this land here, I think for me, this is one of the most sacred places I've ever been. In these mountains here, there are life also, and um, teaching our people from all over to come onto this land so that they can go praying on top of the mountains. Some of them go for three nights and four days, and they pray with no food and water. It's part of the, the sacrifice that we wanted to be able to have where we could put a sweat lodge up so that people can do the ceremonies. One of the greatest things that I see is missing from the young people, 
People like myself are raised by elders. And when we become from a young girl into a woman, we have that rite of passage that we have to go in. It's the same thing as the young, young boys turning into men. They have a ritual also to go out in the land and to bring back something like a huge game. That's when you initiate yourself from transferring from a girl to a woman, from a boy into a manhood. If you don't have those skills, you struggle in your life because you really don't know who you are. And I really believe that we're going to have strong people again in the future. And it's through our young people because they're going to be taught. They're going to know what to do. If we don't have the right teachers there, the world's going to collapse. And that's why a lot of us, we work so hard to make sure that those things come into place. I always tell people, in the morning you wake up, your first intuition is always the right one. Don't second guess yourself. Just follow that that day. The wind says the same thing. The only time that the wind blows and the tree is the only time they move. That's the only time they dance. That's the only time they can talk. They're already telling us a story because if you look everywhere else, it's not that windy except for that tree, those willows. So it tells us a story. It's listening to us. And I asked the tree to pass on those stories we just finished talking about for the next group that comes. So that it's that cycle of healing, the cycle of love, the cycle of everything that we're missing. We need to bring those back. We need to bring back laughter. We forgot how to laugh. Sometimes when I do workshop on laughing, all I can hear is from here. <laughs> what kind of laughter is that? <laughs> you gotta laugh right from your pit of your stomach, from your billy billy on, your billy button on. That's why the creator put billy button there. That's where we start laughing from. And the harder you laugh, the harder and the faster you will heal. But when you keep all that in and you don't laugh, you will get sick. Because everything that you hold on to, it gets compact. It goes in your system, in your bones. It goes all over. So that's why I always tell people, don't hold on what was yesterday. Only take what was good yesterday and keep moving with it. So this trip is essentially about reconciliation. Um, the idea was to get a bunch of youth together to uh, travel along the Yukon River, which is a highway that's been used for thousands of years by our local First Nations, um, from Whitehorse all the way to Dawson City for the Moosehide Gathering. Um, along the way, we, were, we have, cel have had celebrations at Carmax with Little Salmon First Nation, uh, as well as Fort Selkirk with the Selkirk First Nation, which both have been really, really wonderful and we have learned a lot at each stop. So I wanted to be picked up in Minto, but the group was faster that day, so they already passed Minto. Um, but Paige and Lance came back with the motorboat to get me. So the first part I was uh, picked up by the motorboat until we found the other crew and then we joined with the canoe. It's been a lot of work doing that and getting set up and making dinner and cleaning up after dinner. And... But it's good work. It's all been good work. Um, I think we have like seven dances or something around there. Um, we we're going to perform at Moose Hide. We went to Juneau this summer to go perform at the celebration. And we went to Neg last year to perform. We've seen so much wildlife. We've seen so many moose and bears, eagles, every stop along the, 
everywhere along the way there's been eagles looking out for us. The camp food is really good. I thought we were going to have like gross food but it's really good because we even got like we just had s'mores and chili and I'm eating a watermelon. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have been laughing and yeah, it's good times for sure. We had hot dogs. That was good. We we're going to have chicken, but it was frozen. So we're going to have some fish though. Oh yeah, we have fish. Long and tiring, lots of paddling. It was actually really scary, those waves were scary. So yeah, I'm glad it's all over with. I did, I did this river trip from Teslam to Carmax when I was uh, young, younger, so I wanted to kind of relive the moments again. We traveled from above Canyon, Cannon Creek, at Coffee Creek, to here, which is where the White River came, into the Yukon River, and it was a really good day. We hustled about six times right across the river from one side to the other side. It, you feel like you're going to tip over or something and everyone's weight can balance it out. And that, yeah, I like it. I was really scared at first because I really thought we were going to tip. But the more we were on it, uh, I felt good. I got asked to uh, apply basically because we had to write a letter about why we wanted to come and ended up getting selected and it's pretty cool. I'm enjoying myself so far and learning a lot. Uh, you know with a 500 pound canoe with nine people in it it's uh, you just have to think a little further ahead. I'm glad we had a a guide to go in front of us most of the way to uh, to show us the way and uh, keep us all safe. So it's worked out well, and uh, I had a great day. We we've, we've worked hard together in that in at Sua in the dugout canoe. We've worked so hard, like we everyone's arms are sore, everyone's hot, everyone's tired, but we keep paddling, we keep pushing, and we keep pushing each other. Um, well, I never, I never really went in and dug out before, especially one that was hand-carved. There was some hardships and rain and wind crossing the barge, but uh, I joined at CarMax, and some people have been on this trip from the very beginning, and you know they're pretty tired, and we're doing very long days. But uh, people just keep on going and they have energy and it's, it's a lot of fun. The Carleton students leaving us was a real bummer. I was hoping to see my friend Jen again and experience this a bit with her and get to know a few of the other Carleton students and hear their stories and what they came up with. But So that's, that kind of sucked when that happened, <laughs> not going to lie. Today I actually got to pilot the Atsua and uh, it's a great honor and uh, a lot of fun. This whole trip is pretty meaningful to a lot of people and uh, to me as well and to be trusted with something so important is pretty special to me. Something that I will never forget. Maybe favor plays our cards. The time is now and never cease to change.
as good as the best. <laughs> When we hit, uh, went down the river and started, it started with the grandmother and grandfather loon. They followed us. Their job was to follow us and watch us and keep us safe. They did that right down to Carmax almost. Now it's in a when they cast a mushroom で、ま、ね、ね、か、ね、ちゃんで、で。で、ちゃん、で、かね、ちゃんで、で、そのまし、で、で。で、ちゃん、ま、ね、ね、で、ね、ちゃん、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、
This trip shows unity. When I see a different First Nation youth who to me are our future coming down and going down on this journey together. It's like a drum when you hold a drum. When I was in Ottawa one time, uh, a couple of years ago for opening of the books when I was sent to Ottawa and there's many different First Nations that was with me and we all were holding our drum. It didn't matter if he was Métis or he was Blackfoot or Cree. We all held our drum together and we hit it together. We were one people. It was unity. And that's what a circle around a drum represents a circle of life. When an old man passes on, a young child is born as it goes with the season and everybody else like that. After summer comes fall, then comes winter. Then spring comes back again, renewal, everybody else like that. So, so it all goes in cycle. And this trip is It's something that our people need to, it's also so reconciliation with Canada. And passing on what knowledge that we do have to these youth is so important. So it will make them stronger and they will be tomorrow's leaders. Do you enjoy it? 30, 13 yeah. off, everybody else What do you out. enjoy it mo What do you enjoy most in the trip? Um, just being on the land and paddling, having a good time. Just going to each community and being welcomed by each community. Wow. Good. So, did you like Side feast song. yesterday? Yes, that was really good. I like that they gave us eagle feathers too. <laughs> They gave us eagle feathers, they fed us good, and they gave us lots of pie. What does it mean for you? Respect, and love for one another, and opening each other with open arms, and just being there for one another when, when, when needed. So would you like to go to the trip like that again? Oh, yeah. Maybe next year? Oh yeah, I would do it again, for sure. If you guys do it, call me on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so we're in CarMax now. We got here today at what, like five? Five-ish? Um, we were all really tired and didn't quite make the paddle to CarMax, so we stopped in Little Salmon and Lance had organized a van to take us into town for our celebration. The celebration was wonderful. We all got eagle feathers. This is Nishka's. It's really pretty. Um, we got fed and there's tons of people there, which was cool. Lots of people from Bite and Boys and Girls Club. And it was really wonderful that they came and showed their support. And we love them so much. But we are so tired. And now we've been left at the place that we showered at and it's 11.30. And I'm just really frustrated. Why are you frustrated? I'm frustrated by the day because we were on the can canoe. We left late, as usual. Definitely photo really. Okay. So we're planning on getting there at a decent time. What's that? Are we planning on getting there at a decent time? Um, depends again. I'll pass you if we can get up. Can I walk through? How is the how is the mud? As good as it gets. Many times when people, they look at the, the Yukon, the first thing they think about the gold rush, they don't realize that there was people here thousands of years in the making a culture. People that are part of the land, the water. They were part of the ecosystem that held that balance, that governed themselves that hunted the great mammoth people that survived here since the ice ages. When Canada talks about reconciliation, all the things that happened to me, I, I forgave Canada because there are Canadians that are older that are good, 
we are of many cultures and we are of many different people. And rediscovering the First Nation people, the original people of the land. It's one of the only ways that uh, Canada will over come clean and wipe the mistakes of the paths. The 60 scoops, the residential square, and everything. They apologize, and I forgave. But most of all, I, I had to forgive myself. It wasn't me, though. It was beyond my control. Teaching people from other cultures about our, of who we are. Holding a drum in my hand is hitting it on top of a mountain and let it, to hear it echo across the valley whenever I'm troubled, to let that go in the wind. That's who I am, Anata. In English way, I'm Joseph. I love my country. That's why I served in the reserves for 27 years in the military. I would give my life for this country to protect it. If I was ever asked, I would. Because we all live here and we should live in harmony and nobody should be above the other. Nobody is better than the other. Masicho. My friend and I, we bought brand new skidoo. We went all the way to Fort Simpson. We bought brand new skidoos, and so we come back. Hey, look at the mountains. We look at the mountains. We want to go up it. So we took the skidoos, we started going up. Halfway up the, the mountain, his skidoo broke in front of me. So I couldn't pass him or anything. And so he said, I, I, I have to take a look at it, and I don't know anything to do with mechanics. I said that in my language. And the, the other guy says, well, me too. I don't know nothing about skidoo, so we just have to figure it out ourselves. Just then a raven come over there and stood up on a tree, looked down at these two elders stuck up in the mountain. He was going, ah, 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 stupid, stupid. <laughs> Standing there, looking down these two elders, and just trying to pull that skidoo, trying, trying. Nothing happened. So that raven looked down and started laughing at the end. That old oh man says, you laugh again, I'm going to catch you, you're going to get this, he says. So the old man fooling around like that, and then he closed the cover again, tried nothing. And so finally the raven got so tired, he looked down, he goes, squawk, squawk. 
Smoke pluck! Smoke pluck! So the old man opened the hood again, unscrewed the old spark plug, and took out a brand new spark plug and he put it in. And he just went, vroom, vroom. The vehicle, I mean, the skidoo started. That, <coughs> that raven looked down at him and he says, Stupid! Stupid! <laughs> stupid! Stupid! He flew away, stupid. <laughs> All this time it was a spark plug. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that's how stories go. Um, long time ago, is that how the animals and the human beings travel with each other? When the world was pretty brand new, it split the people into four directions on this turtle island. That's why you see different nationality and different languages happening. Is because the animals follow the the trail of the uh, people that were in the four directions. Roll it. What is your name? Danke, Anata. Hanjat, and the sea. Take a cho, hot dun, and the sound jig, and the sea. Masi cho, you see. My name is Joseph. In my people's way, uh, they call me Anata. I was named after. Uh, an elder from a long, long time ago and from the Ajak area. And um, receiving a, a name is important or you have no identity. And I said, I am the Croatland of the big river people, the Northern Shoshone people where the two rivers meet. And uh, today, uh, welcoming people that come from long, long way and uh, a long time ago, our people used this river. It's life to us. It feeds us. It also, uh, we travel by it. It was a transportation system too. We get the salmon from it. We get uh, everything from it. And uh, when we want to go somewhere or something to get there, and there's a, a big pot of lots down in Fort Selkirk or Minto or anything else they got there. Before the highways, we have uh, the huge moose boats that we get on. And they say sometimes uh, a moose boat can fit 12 dogs and their whole team and a family. And they head down and they travel by that system and uh, down the river. And um, on both sides of the river, there are trails, ancient trails that go way back. And when people come from other areas, we welcome them onto our territory. And usually we feed them and everybody else got out there and we give them something to remember. And um, years ago when the, the coast tribes used to come in and they trade with us once a year and uh, our people would wait for them 
and have stuff from the interior, furs, all kinds of different stuff there to trade with them. And they bring in shells, they bring in all kinds of different uh, stuff from the coast that we can't get and we, we trade. And when they're coming and we have a spotter up there and said they're coming and all uh, the men will go down, line up with their drums. And as soon as the canoes come around the corner and they start hitting their drums and the women would hold their hand out like this. It's a sign of love, compassion, welcome, and many things, sir. They pull in and they would ask permission to come in. We says, yes, come in. And after that, there would be a big feast and nonstop the drum would be going, hand games, trading. Sometimes uh, a woman would find a husband and head down south or else a man would find a wife and stay here. And that's how we got relations, cousins, and back and forth, or, and related to the people in the coast. And the ceremony of giving away an eagle feather. And to give that away, to show that uh, when you're a host and you're, that you're coming onto our land, we give you something to remember that you were here. And down the road, maybe years from now, you'd hold that eagle feather and remember that time that you were here. And, uh, and that goes back a long way. It's not only here in the Yukon, but <clears throat> it's right across Canada. That, uh, that's why. I, Eagle feather is so highly valued among our people. And when um, we're talking here, if an eagle flies over, it's a sign there that you're blessed in a way. And it's you're even more blessed if a feather drops. And uh, so um, that is one of the ceremonies. And when we throw on a feast, as it goes when we give you something, you're in our way and you have to accept it. And uh, that's why uh, we keep giving you food and we have to tell all the food was gone. And that is our way and that's always been our way for, before the Europeans came, before the, um, the system when the road came through and our people that never knew uh, different people that came here and they call them Guchans in our language and they never saw them before and um, it changed things from there. Things started changing.
Is that good? That's great. Um, what does this trip uh, mean to you, seeing youth from different backgrounds come together down this ancient highway? What, what, what emotions does that bring to you? <clears throat> and you can look at uh, This trip is so important and Two years ago, it started off as um, there was, uh, I believe there were some troubled young men in their lives. And when I uh, met a Quanlan Dunn elder, William Carlick, who's a friend of mine from the past, and I wanted to see what I can do to help from this end. And they took the dugout canoe that was from the youth and they were heading down to Konsai to make it to Mooseide. Welcoming people onto our territory is so important. It's something that we can never lose. And to showing them not only that we're welcome, that we also love them in a way that we hope them well on their trip and that uh, to hand them something. And so that they can remember who we are and to know that they're, they're welcome back and 
Northern Shoshone territory. And for them to make them stronger on their journey and give them a blessing. And someday down the road, maybe I'll be in one of their country and they'll remember and say, hey, Joseph, welcome to our territory, remember? And you will get Canada made a law to do what you call the residential school error and that uh, was designed to uh, kill the Indian in you That's, and uh, many uh, children were taken to be able to stop or to wipe out the people it's almost like genocide there you know, and the children are the ones are the future and they take the children against the will away from the parents, their grandparents, separate from the people. 
They're not allowed to speak their language, to practice their culture. Or anything else I know because uh, I was one of these kids.
your experience. Like right now? Yes. We are... Tell me what, what happened and what do you think and about your experience. Well, there's a bunch of complications on the road. The road. Um, the group has split. That was not planned or intended. It just happened. Without going into details, there was one boat that was picking somebody up and then there was a switch of the boats and then there was this and that and um, the big canoe and one of the um, supporting boats went ahead and the rest of the boats, the support boats, stayed behind and um, we are here with, um, with the family of and two kids and one canoe and this rigged canoe here. Um, a little bit confused about where we are and uh, um, not sure how much longer we should uh, keep on going and uh, it's a little bit confusing and stressful so just um, just trying to figure that out and on top of that well, yeah well like one of the boats just uh, had some technical issues they, they smoked the prop so we're just now waiting for them to be able to uh, to fix that boat so that we can continue. Um, the terrain here is, the river here is a little bit tricky because there's a lot of sandbars and um, some of them are just really, are really hard to see and you have to really focus on where we're going. I don't think that any of us is that much ex has that much experience with the ri river right now so we're just going slow and uh, trying to uh, make sure that we get there safely. Yeah. And another question. <clears throat> This is your first time riding this kind of canoe and kind of uh, boat. Uh, what do you think about it? Because you experienced before riding the motorboat, but not this kind of motorboat. This particular thing right now is, is three canoes put together. Um, it's harder to steer because they are put together, and, um, but it has a good motor, so that's good. Um, it's um, it's n probably not as easy to drive it as the motorboat because it does not have as much power. And yeah, um, so do you like to drive this one more or the uh, normal? Not my favorite. <laughs> okay, thank you.